He doesn't make Hollywood blockbusters. Heck, he's not even based in Hollywood. He's in Laguna Beach. But Greg McGilvery is a pioneering and highly respected director who has captured many of the greatest images ever seen on a big screen. A really big screen. If you've ever been in an IMAX theater, you've probably thrilled to his work. 36 films over 50 years, grossing over a billion dollars, and he's still going strong. A life of adventure, challenging and celebrating nature. Greg McGilvery, right now on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Five Point. Five Point is an independent real estate development company with assets under management across California. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Chapman University, with its Center for Science and Technology, under construction in Orange, California, is a proud sponsor of Inside OC. Is, is there. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's pretty fun. It is, it is. Well, hi, I'm Rick Reef. Welcome to Inside OC, and I'm talking with filmmaker Greg McGilvery. Greg, great to have you back well, on the show. You, Rick. It's been a few years, and uh, you know, let's talk. Uh, you've had this tremendous career over 50 years now, you've been doing yeah. this. Describe yourself. What kind of a, of a filmmaker are you? I'm first a visualist. I, I started as a cameraman, a, a photographer, um, built a dark room when I was 13 in my garage. And I, I love images. I love to try to move an audience with a series of beautiful scenes, things that will take their breath away, things they'll remember forever. And so my films are visual wonders, I think. Um, and that's why maybe people like them. Yeah. Uh, you also work, uh, I, how do you work plot and, uh, you know, uh, because you're a filmmaker, so you've got to tell a story, right? So you've got to have a little tension going on or a little story. How, 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 do you do that when you sit down? Do you kind of know, uh, uh, talk about the process you go through if you're going to make a movie. Yeah, well, we, we do documentaries. So um, really it's what you get when you're out there filming. But we write a script initially before we go out after, after doing about a year of, of research and trying to find those tension moments, those uh, character moments that will work on a big screen, an IMAX screen. Um, and then we go out like with uh, National Parks Adventure, we went out with Conrad Anker, who's a world renowned climber and his son and his, uh, the, the, his son's best friend, Rachel Pohl, and, and we told the story of their travels. They've been doing these travels every year for the last 10 years where they go to the national parks whenever they have time together. And it's basically just uh, seeing what you get when you get there. Yeah. We, we write things out in advance, uh, but then really a lot, lot of the times better things happen when we're on location. Well, as you say, you try to capture those images. So what better way to give the viewers an idea of what McGilvery Freeman Films is all about than to show, let McGilvery <laughs> Freeman tell the story. So here we are. Hello, my name is Jim Freeman. This is my partner, Greg McGilvery. We're filmmakers who live in Laguna Beach. For the last 50 years, we've focused on crafting the best visuals possible, creating timeless, iconic imagery coupled with compelling stories. McGillivray Freeman started out while my dad was growing up in the 60s. He and his partner, Jim Freeman, were making the most visually artful surf films while pioneering new camera technologies for both water and air. I didn't go anywhere without my camera. With my partner and best friend, Jim, we shot all over the world, then came back to edit the films in our mini studio, an old house in Laguna Beach. We've shot many, many rolls of film. In fact, we've made quite a few films on surfing. 
made a film called The Sunshine Sea, and a film which is our latest film called Five Summer Stories. We started receiving a lot of attention from commercial productions. Five Summer Stories was our thank you and goodbye to the surfing world. Now we're getting into commercial films that uh, are much more interesting and much more challenging for us. We then started working in Hollywood and had the honor of working with many fantastic directors. In 1974 came an opportunity that changed our company's direction forever. We were asked to make a film using a new format called IMAX for the opening of the Smithsonian's brand new five-story tall IMAX screen. They wanted a film that had emotion and passion, not just facts and figures, and that was our specialty. We used our experience in aerial filmmaking and adapted and invented new techniques for the bigger film format. No one had heard of IMAX yet, but we took advantage of its vastly superior quality, creating an experience that was as close as you can get to being there. To Fly premiered to packed audiences, and it is still playing at the Smithsonian today. Matter of fact, we'll probably be making films until we die. But my partner and best friend, Jim Freeman, didn't have the opportunity to see it. He died in a helicopter crash two days before the opening. To this day, we carry his name to honor him and his legacy. We have created 35 IMAX films since. We've made five of the top 10 grossing IMAX films, and we are the only documentary film company that has passed $1 billion in box office sales. We've been nominated for two Academy Awards for our films The Living Sea and Dolphins. But my dad and I believe that just making great films isn't enough. We've built strong, long-lasting partnerships with hundreds of museums and aquariums to distribute our films around the world. We go beyond entertainment, stimulating people's sense of wonder. We aim to not just spark the imagination, but to light a fire in the mind, inspiring a new generation of lifelong learners. We recognize the power of partnering with people and companies who are doing amazing work and have been able to bring their branch to the giant screen. Over the years, we've had the honor of working with talented artists who give our stories a compelling voice and music that transports an audience. As technology and media have changed, we've expanded our storytelling to beyond the theater. We now produce visual stories across a variety of platforms, from iPhone to IMAX, creating new ways for us and our clients to communicate to people and share the stories that move them. The one thing that hasn't changed over the 50 years is our love for our work and the passion that we put into our projects. some of the joy that we've experienced in making these films. Okay, so I think that's a nice, uh, that's, 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 that's a nice little summary uh, very, very quickly of, of what you do. You know, I notice you start with Jim Freeman, who was, who was your buddy, your surf buddy. That's how you guys started out. Yeah, we, we actually were making films alone before we teamed up. Surf uh, movies, right? Surfing uh, movies. We were, we were both in college. I released my first film when I was a freshman. He, he did the same thing. Now, was, was this before or after Endless Summer? How you, the, the it was right at the movie. same time. Endless okay. Summer, Summer came out in 64. I released my first film just two months before the Endless Summer came out. And, of course, my film had taken four years to make and was really weird and, and strange and had very artful and and it got its own little audience. Uh, and then this epic film comes out, The Endless Summer by Bruce Brown. And I looked at that and I went, 
oh no, I'm, I'm completely <laughs> ruined. You know, this film is gonna trounce me. And it, it, it did, it, it actually was so successful that it inspired me in so many different ways. And Bruce Brown, who's a, a good friend, um, his career arc, uh, I tried to follow for a number of years because um, you know, he was able to do what he loved to do and I thought, oh, maybe I can do that too. And, yeah. and things turned out pretty well that way. And so you had Jim, Jim was your, your surf buddy, and it yeah. just seems in some ways so poignant. Here, here think of the life, uh, the dreams the two of you had. He dies young and tragically, and all the years since then. I have, uh, is, he still, is he still part of you? Oh yeah. Well, we just celebrated um, or honored the, the 40th year since his death, and we all gathered at his graveside and, and uh, told stories and, and remembered the good times. And the, the 12 years that we spent together were really the, the best years of my life, besides the time that, that I was raising and Barbara and I were raising our kids. It, it super intense yeah. work, seven days a week, yeah. Uh, we never took a vacation. You know, we just loved what we did. And the relationship was so strong that, that uh, you know, we'd finish each other's sentences. And um, it was just yeah. a joy to, to work with him. He, he died in a helicopter crash yeah. filming, right? I mean, was yeah. he, do, he, he was doing <laughs> what you guys do. We were up, we were hired to do four major TV commercials uh, for Kodak, and uh, we were filming those up at Bishop, California, up in the Sierras, and the helicopter had a malfunction and crashed into the trees, and so Jim and, and another fellow were, were killed, and, and uh, two of the other, the pilot and, and someone else, uh, crawled away from the wreckage and were saved, um, but that changed yeah. my life forever. Yeah, and I think it points out the some of the dangers you take in your job because when I saw you yeah. about a year ago, you were limping around <laughs> because you had just finished a, 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 a documentary we're going to talk about shortly, the one now showing national parks. You got frostbite. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a it's a high risk occupation. It is. It's it's a l little bit more treacherous than than just sitting at a desk all the time. What we have to do is is get our cameras into the most kind of outrageous positions. And when you're trying to do that, either with surfing or with hang gliding or with any kind of subject that we do, mountain biking, you end up taking some risks. And what we try to do is calculate the risks and make sure we're as safe as possible uh, and have all the safety planning worked out. But sometimes things so go wrong. So the frostbite came because you got one of those kind of moments that are, yeah. is like it, it, your average person will never be where you were. Explain that a little oh, bit. Oh, this was the most exceptional place. Uh, pictured rocks, National Seashore, on the, the, the shores of, of Lake Michigan, up in Upper Michigan. It was super cold, minus 20 degrees. And we were out there for about six or seven days straight um, filming these ice climbing sequences, and then we discovered this cave where it was like a movie set. It was the most beautiful place I'd ever seen. So we brought the cameras there and the lights and staged an entire scene there. But while we were there, it was so cold that my boots really weren't working that great, and and I suffered frostbite. And and so my my feet were numb for about four months after the shoot. And I went to the doctor and he said, well, it may go away or it may not. <laughs> <laughs> and fortunately, it went away. It went so, away. <laughs> so that's the film now showing at, at some of the IMAX yeah. uh, theaters and things. Tell us a little bit about the, the movie National Parks. Well, last year or this year actually is the, the celebration of 100 years of the National Park Service. And we wanted to make a movie to basically celebrate how wonderful it is that we have these 400 sites that the National Park Service is protecting forever for all of us. 
These are the biggest things that you and I and everyone in America will ever own. They're more valuable than anything else we can ever, ever purchase. And so we have to protect them. The National Park Service, the first time in human history, a hundred years ago, said, we treasure these places, let's make sure that they stay as they are today forever. Not yeah. just for a year, but for 10,000 years. And so this revolutionary thought of setting aside regions of the world for all of us to share for yeah. free was an amazing yeah. um, set of ideas. And some people call it the best American right. idea it's, uh, ever. I'll tell you, and those, and the, that cave, that ice cave you talk about is part of it. It's, yeah. it's all there. And Ken Burns did the, uh, the historic black and white version, yeah. if you will, and you've got the living color version of the national parks. Uh, music's a big part of, yeah. of, of that, uh, as, as it is with many of your documentaries. Uh, what kind of a role uh, does, mm -hmm. does, does music play? It's, integral and it's so very important because it carries the emotion and the the context and the culture and the and the beat of each one of these scenes um, and with our films we've done pretty unusual things in 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 forming relationships um, with recognized uh, artists like Sting or George Harrison or Paul McCartney and uh, our composer, Steve Wood, who's in Laguna Beach and I've been working with for the last 30 years, he will work with these artists and mm -hmm. get the best out of their material so that you'll recognize some of the songs within yeah. the film um, and they'll give you more of an emotional right. charge, more of a significant feeling. Um, and so the power of the movie becomes yeah. even greater. You mentioned some of the big names. Uh, uh, Sir Paul McCartney has worked with you, oh, yeah. hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And, and actors too. You get for voiceovers and things like that. Meryl Streep, uh, Tom Selleck. I mean, uh, so, so you kind of mix with the Hollywood crowd a bit. A bit. Um, every once in a while, Robert Redford, who, who's done two of our films, was, was the narrator for National Parks Adventure. Um, it's actually kind of fun to get to know these people because these people are at the top of their game. They're very confident and self-assured and, and accomplished and, and they don't have some of the, uh, the, the problems that um, some of the, the lesser Hollywood movie stars have. And you don't have, have to deal with them. You only deal with, yeah. with, with the top line. All right, but to talk about that Hollywood dynamic. I, I kind of teased it at the beginning of the show. Uh, you're sort of Hollywood and sort of not, right? You're this Laguna Beach surfer guy. Uh, what's your relationship with Hollywood? Well, I, I did work in Hollywood for about 10 years. Um, Jim and I had a place up there and we, we essentially did Hollywood films, The Towering Inferno and Jonathan Livingston Siegel. And you were big, cameramen big on Wednesday. those? Or? We were cameramen and, and also co-producers in some cases. Um, and so, I liked doing that. It's just that when the IMAX industry started to take off in uh, the early 80s, it became an opportunity for me um, to basically do what I want, uh, which is move people with beautiful imagery, show them the beauty of the world, get them to respect nature more, and to get them to try to conserve our oceans and our air and our beautiful mountains. and. Uh, and to teach people through yeah. good movie making. And that goal just sounded so powerful. I felt that even if I didn't make a really great living from it, if I just got by, it would be worth it. It would be worth it to do that in Laguna where I didn't have to go to LA, didn't have to deal with all kinds of outside forces, Hollywood studios and such, and I could do it on my own. And yeah. I, I love the idea of doing things on your own. So if folks want to see your stuff on an IMAX screen here in Orange County or the rest of Southern California, where do they go? Well, unfortunately, we don't have a, a museum theater here. We have one in L.A. at the California Science Center, down in San Diego at the Fleet Space Theater, uh, up at uh, San Jose at the Tech Museum. Um, there's 250 sites around the uh -huh. world that we run our films uh -huh. and they're in the biggest museums in the world and 
they do really well. They get seen yeah. for over a year at each one of these places. Um, people come back many, many times to see them. And because it's an, an experience on this gigantic yeah. screen, the films are only 40 minutes, but you get an experience like you can't get anywhere else. Yeah, and so uh, in Orange County, uh, there's an IMAX screen at, at the Spectrum. At the Spectrum. Yeah. Okay. So how come there's no museum? Uh, <laughs> have you uh, have you worked on that? Have you? <laughs> I know. Well, we we actually tried at the Great Park to get a museum and an IMAX theater there, and uh, uh, when that kind of imploded with the uh, the change of the economy in 2008. Yeah. Um, well, the economy's back, right? Let's, I know. Uh, well, maybe we're going to do that again. Re revisit it. I hope so. Yeah, let's, uh, that's a great idea. Your next film coming up soon. Tell us about that. The next film is called Dream Big, and its goal is to get young American kids interested in science and technology. STEM engineering is really the goal. Um, America needs more engineers, and so the Bechtel Foundation and the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, partnered with us on this movie that shows how adventurous and interesting a career in engineering can be. And the goal is to get now, I'm thinking, more kids. Now, so, I'm thinking, gee, that doesn't sound real exciting. So how do you make it exciting? Well, you go to places like the Great Wall and you show how the Chinese, you know, 2,000 years ago built this wall that is still standing. Um, and the secrets that they use to build this wall and how um, people like Avery Bangs can build these footbridges with next to no money in places, impoverished places like Haiti and keep people safe because, because people are dying every year by trying to cross these rivers that don't have bridges. And so we, we, we tell the story of engineering and how important it is to keep people safe through proper building. And, uh, and it's a, an emotional story. And of course you got your, your, your uh, thrilling uh, uh, aerial shots and everything, yep. so that makes it exciting. Now is this kind of a new approach for you? You're, you partnered with Bechtel and the Civil Engineering Society and those kinds of things. Is this something, is this a new approach for you to partner with corporations in producing uh, it, uh, it, films? It is, it, and what it does, it allows us to get much more mileage out of the film because not only are we making this film for a certain mission and purpose, but they sh are sharing in that mission, and so they promote it through all of their channels, and the more partners that we end up getting, um, the more, messaging we can get out to the public. So it's all these tentacles reaching out educationally to try to get people engaged, watching the movie, and then understanding the message that we want them to, to get. And so the more partners that we can have, and my son, who's now president of the company, our, our company, um, does this better than anyone. He. Uh -huh can partner with so many of various So he's, he's more of a businessman than he's, his dad is? <laughs> well, I was always pretty good at business, but he is actually far better. And so he uh, he's able, I, I think it's just the energy level that yeah. he has, and, and so, he's so good yeah. on the phone. So, so being an artist, how do you work, of course, you know, as a journalist, I sometimes encounter that same thing. How do you, you know, you want to support and you know, these corporations feel they have a story that they want you to tell, but you, do you maintain the independence that you decide what goes on the film and everything so that it's not just, you know, propaganda, for example? Oh, absolutely. They, they don't really have anything to do with the story. Um, we pick our own characters. We pick our own uh, situations to show, um, you know, the the relationship is really pretty pretty sound. It's, it's like our relationship with the National Park Service. They didn't care where we shot. They just wanted us to do an accurate job. Right. And so yeah. that's the way we do it. Okay, almost out of time. Wanted to cover quickly. How many IMAX screens are kind of a booming in, uh, in a lot of developing countries? Yeah, right? there's, there's over a thousand IMAX screens today. It's still growing uh, hugely. So, um, I don't know if it's 10% a year, but it's, it's almost 10% yeah. growth a year. And um, it's, the, it's the way to see movies. 
Yeah. And their new laser projector is out of this world good. It's, so IMAX technology is keeping up with all of the film technology? They've always been the very best, and they're continuing to be well into the future. Wow, very good. Well, Greg, it is, uh, it is great to have you on. <laughs> Thank Keep you. up the good work. Do you plan on, on doing it, uh, continuing oh, yeah. to do it for a few years? Yeah, I, okay. I, I'll be 50, dragged. and uh, so we'll, uh, yeah. we'll enjoy the next 50. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Yeah. Well, that's it for now. Thanks again to my ageless guest, Greg McGilvery. You can watch this show and past shows at pbsocal.org or rickreef.com. You can also catch our shows and our post-show open mic chatter on YouTube. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Five Point. Five Point is an independent real estate development company with assets under management across California. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Chapman University, with its Center for Science and Technology, under construction in Orange, California, is a proud sponsor of Inside OC.